whether or not people want to admit it, there are differences. And so you have to learn people that you're dealing with. Take the time now more than ever, more than ever, it's easy to find the information. It's at your fingertips. But I also think it's worth engaging with, if, if you don't have a, a black friend, a Hispanic friend, a, a, a gay friend, whatever it is that you can that you can talk to, that'll tell you something too. You're not, you're, your world's pretty, pretty, pretty closed. And now is it closed because of you not opening it up or are you in a place where everybody looks like you? Everybody thinks like you, you have to get outside of that and get to know people, build authentic relationships. And that takes work so that you can really ask questions because I think as much as the information is at your fingertips, talking to people and really getting to know and understand is different. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to The New Normal. I'm Kay Wright, your Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. And today uh, I have a guest with me who I've known for about a, a year now, and she's done some work for uh, our Air Force. Uh, I would say she's an amazing leader, an amazing woman. And uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about uh, her. Uh, she is motivated by her passion to recognize her own BS and correct societal isms like racism, sexism, classism, and plain old stupidism. It is Risha Grant's personal mission to expose the value of diversity and inclusion while shining a light on the economic impact it creates. Risha is the CEO and founder of Risha Grant LLC, an award-winning full-service diversity communications, recruitment, training, and consulting firm. Its mission is to utilize diversity communication strategies, tactics, and training as a catalyst to create inclusive cultures. With almost 20 years of experience working in one of the reddest states in the nation, she will provide us with steps to identify, own, confront our bias by calling BS on the issues that stop us from building inclusive cultures and attracting diverse markets. She is also the author of the book, that's BS, how bias synapse disrupts inclusive cultures and the power to attract diverse markets. Risha, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's, it's really great to see you again. Yeah, you too. And thank you again for the work that not only you did for us, uh, the Chiefs, some time ago, but I understand you've been doing some work around the Air Force. And uh, yeah. we, we, we appreciate it. So, hey, man, let's just jump right into it. Uh, tell me about this current situation. What do you think? What's, what's, what's happening? I, I, think it both, uh, I think it both sucks and, uh, <laughs> and that <laughs> it is, it, it sucks on one hand, but on the other hand, I think that we're about to see real change, real systemic change, you mm -hmm. know, throughout our, our communities, throughout our, our companies, throughout our world. Um, and I'm really excited about that. I, haven't been in the business as long as I have. Um, people check a box a lot. You know, there may be something that causes them to check the box and maybe there's a lawsuit or something like that. But the people that I'm talking to today are saying, what can we do? How can we really, really um, make this a different environment? And so I'm really encouraged by that. Yeah. So what, I mean, Risha, you know, we, I mean, we've been dealing with this as a nation for, I mean, years. So what gives you confidence this time that, that you'll see, that we will see some, some real meaningful change? What's different? People are different. Um, I, as I just said, I realized that for most of my career, people have been doing just that, checking the box. We did diversity training, check. You know, and we feel good for the moment, but we go back to work and, and it's like everything is forgotten except for the people that are daily affected by it. Mm -hmm. Now, as I talk to people, I'm saying to them, if you want to check a box, I'm not the person for you. Mm -hmm. So That's I want to create change. You have to create change through policy. You know, you have to be able to create change through consequence, through economics, and people are willing to do that now. They're willing to say, what does this policy need to look like so that it's inclusive? And what are the consequences if people violate the policy? And I'm seeing that I'm, I'm getting, you know, calls for consulting all over the place. And those are the types of conversations that we're having. 
And as I tell them, I, if you just, if you're just doing this to check a box, I, I, that's fine. But I don't, I don't have to work with you because I really want to figure out how we, how we do this. And that, but that's how they're coming to me. Mm -hmm. They're saying, what does it look like? <laughs> what do I need to do? I'll do it yesterday. <laughs> yeah. So, so speaking of inclusivity, have you seen uh, in the past the level of, of inclusivity and teaming with, with respect to the protesting and the marching and the, um, the amount, the, la the level of diversity that's included, and particularly, let's just be honest, uh, uh, the, the level of white people who have joined in and protesting and, and looking to make this better? White folks are showing up in ways that I never saw or thought possible. Because um, frankly, when, when Ahmaud Arbery was, was murdered, that shook me. I don't know if you watched the video, but when I think about it now, it kind of makes me tremble. And I was, I was hurt and I was upset that even the white folk that I know that do DNI work, diversity and inclusion work, I saw nothing on their social media pages. Nobody's standing up saying this is wrong, except black people that are putting up, uh, you know, the 2.23, which is the miles everybody was going out walking or running in his honor. And I called them out on it because, because we're, we're friends. And if you see this happening constantly, where are you? And so I, I, you know, I had some people, uh, some people hit me up and, and tell me, you know, Hey, I, I know this is happening. I'm not sure what to say, but by the time between Ahmaud Arbery, Brianna, uh, Brianna Taylor, and then, uh, George Floyd, complete and total shift, complete and total shift. I've saw, pictures of, of white women linking arms and standing between police and the black protesters. A woman protecting a, a, a black man, you know, by hugging him, by putting her body over him. I mean, it's, it has been amazing. And the number of texts and calls and direct messages and emails that I've received uh, from people that I've known over the years that have said, I truly didn't get it, but I get it now. And when I ask why now, because we've been crying out about this for so long, something about the number of them and watching George Floyd literally die for nine minutes, for almost nine minutes, um, shook people to the core. Yeah, it's, you know, I heard somebody mentioned uh, previously that, uh, that George Floyd was the tipping point for mm -hmm. a lot of us, right? So that was kind of the thing that made most people say, all right, enough is enough. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, he was a catalyst um, because I think you could you could really, really see the humanity and you got to the in, I'm sorry, the inhumanity and you you saw it from beginning to end. And a lot of these other cases. The first thing that people do is try to go and criminalize the person that was murdered. Well, you know, he's gone to jail before he's done this before he's done that before. And I think. Um, you couldn't do that with Ahmaud Arbery, you know, but people were still, that happened two months before we ever saw it happen. But mm -hmm. with, with George Floyd, I mean, you saw the, pretty much the entire exchange of yeah. what happened. And, I, and you, if you have any ounce of empathy in your heart, you know, that's hard to ignore. Yeah. Hey, you've been in this business uh, a long time and, and you've engaged in so many different, different areas. Why is it so hard for us as, and, and I'll just speak for us as Americans, you know, black, white, and, and specifically black and white. Why is it so hard for us to talk about race and racism? Because you have to sit in that discomfort. You have to know black people are angry about it. Um, angry, but tired, weary, like soul tired. Racism is... It is something that we are groomed to understand from the time that we're born, for the most part. Our parents, our grandparents, like they know it and they want to teach us how to be safe. So it is a part of our everyday life. Mm -hmm. When you talk about it with white people, especially white people who are not racist and have, you know, have a good heart, I don't, they don't truly understand, they don't truly grasp the brevity of it. And they don't, and I think from, from my experience, I don't think that they grasp 
that we actually really navigate the world differently than they do. And when they get it, when, when, when they really understand that, they will, they will rock with you or, or help you do whatever when they really see that there, there's, a di- there's a real difference. And I think that it's uncomfortable to hear that. And, and if you have to say to them, and this thing that you say, or this thing that you do, that thing is racist. That thing has racial undertone. People that have a good heart, it's hard to accept that there are some things about you that are really hurtful to somebody else. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so what, what strategies do you typically recommend in making it a more palatable conversation? Is it just, hey, man, there's lots of hard conversations in life and you just got to deal with them uh, just like any, anything else? Or, or, I mean, do you have strategies that you typically uh, teach to help people uh, have open and honest conversations about race and racism? I do. Um, Part of it is what you said. You know, it's, hey, this is going to, it's going to hurt a little bit, but we all have work to do to become better people. All of us. Once you figure out what those weaknesses are, you work on those and you become stronger in those, in that area. And this just may be an area that you need to, to be stronger in. Even with myself, what helps my strategy is that you look at, you look inside first. You identify what your issues are. Mm-hmm. unconscious bias, racism, any of the isms, classism, uh, ageism, you know, you look inside and you begin to do the work. Then once you figure out what that is, for me, it was a mistrust of white people mm-hmm. because I grew up uh, with my grandmother teaching me, trying to teach me how to protect myself, what I need to do to get ahead in life. It, it caused a mistrust of white people. And, you know, and so I grew up with that. But once you figure out what that is, then you have to own it. This is how I feel. It's not right. Every white person, I don't need to mistrust. I need to figure out within me how to deal with that. And now that I've figured that out, now that I've identified it and owned it, owned it I'm going to confront it. And confronting it for me looks like doing the work doing the work. It's like anything else. You have to do the work. If you want to lose weight, you have to do the work. If you want to become a better athlete, you do the work. You want to become a better, a better soldier, a better airman, you do the work. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't escape us in any other part of life. It's not going to escape us uh, in dealing with the nation's worst ever <laughs> act against, against humans. And that's racism. Yeah. So in this case, what does the work consist of? Does, is that, does that mean you have to put in the work to, to learn, uh, to, learn. to educate yourself about uh, different cultures and the effects of systemic racism? Yes. And you need to, cultural competency is a really basic level, just kind of understanding cultures are different. They really are. There are different characteristics that, um, that are within each culture that if you don't understand them, for instance, uh, it's, and it's one of the things that I've talked to law enforcement about with Black people, and even in my trainings, it comes up all the time that Black people are loud. We're loud. We're, uh, we, we get angry quick, and we're, you know, and which is, there's some truth to it, even though it's a, it's a stereotype, there's some truth to it, but it's really that Black people are really expressive people. We talk with our hands. We We're loud, we're loud when we're having a good time, we're loud when we're mad, that's just, that's, you have to expect a certain amount of that, but if you don't know me at all, and you pull me over, and you've never had any type of interaction in that way with a black person, which we see a lot here in Oklahoma, is that, you know, cops get out of the academy, they come from really small towns where there may not be any black people, and then they stick them in the, in the heart of the black community. And whether or not people want to admit it, there are differences. And so you have to learn people that you're dealing with. Take the time. Now more than ever, more than ever, it's easy to find the information. It's at your fingertips. But I also think it's worth engaging with, if, if you don't have a, a black friend, a Hispanic friend, a, a, a gay friend, whatever it is that you can, that you can talk to, that'll tell you something too. You're not, <laughs> your, your world's pretty, pretty, pretty closed. And now is it closed because of you not opening it up or are you in a place where everybody looks like you 
everybody thinks like you. You have to get outside of that and get to know people, build authentic relationships. And that takes work so that you can really ask questions because I think as much as the information is at your fingertips, talking to people and really getting to know and understand is different. Wow. That's powerful. I, I appreciate that. Hey, tell us about uh, BS, bias synapse. What, what, is that, what does that mean? And, uh, and uh, how, how can we... Like, do I have to be nice in, in explaining what it means or... <laughs> no, no, you tell us exactly what it means. Because we were just talking about having tough, real conversations, right? So let's, let's do it now. Bias synapse is a play on bullshit. And the reason why is, so bias synapse talks is, is um, about your brain, the brain's role in unconscious bias. So the brain, if, I, if we go back to eighth grade science for a moment, uh, a synapse is where all of our memories occur. You know, it's, it's where it, Joseph Ledeau, who is a brain researcher, he wrote a book called The Synaptic Self, and he explains that all of our memories, everything about our lives are created in the synapse of our brain. But those brain cells only go in one direction, that direction being negative. That's how I see bias. It's always in the direction of negative. So I came up with it as a twist on bullshit because when you treat people differently based on some diverse characteristic, that's bullshit. That's, you, have to, you have to know, you have to turn your brain off autopilot. And our brains do work on autopilot. You know, we can drive home or to work and have no idea how we got there. Zero I because we're used to making that, you know, uh, making that trip every day. But you have to turn your brain off autopilot because also as with, with bias synapse, with unconscious bias, is, you know, bias synapse is another word for unconscious bias. With <coughs> bias because we've learned things about people, we size them up really quick. You know, this person looks like the last person that hurt me. So I'm going to, you know, instead of, let me say it an easier way. If a person offends you, say a black person offends you, hurts you, does something to you. Instead of dealing with that one person, not only do you deal with that person, but you deal with everybody that looks like that person. So every time you even see a person remotely, same skin color, your brain goes back to, oh, no, I need to stay away from that person. I need to, I need to shut down. I need to put this wall up. Turn your brain off autopilot and start talking to people for who they are and for how they treated you, not for the group that they belong to or look like they belong to. Yeah. So, so that's what it is. Yeah. How do you think BS is playing out in this current situation? A lot. A lot. Because that's... That, that's what it is. If we don't, to me, unchecked bias turns into the isms. It turns into the racism, the classism, the sexism, all of those things. You have to check yourself when you notice it. When you know that you're uncomfortable around a person, ask yourself why you're uncomfortable around that person. Mm -hmm. Is there a real reason for it? Or is it just that you remember something your parents told you a long time ago about how you should be around this person? We when we don't handle something, I don't care what it is, when you don't handle it, when it's something small, mm -hmm. it grows into something big. Now, every time you see a black man, you have fear. You know, I, I think a lot about these murders and, and one, of, one of the murders outside of George Floyd that bothers me the most is Philando Castile. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that man could have done differently, but the fear that the officer had I mean, you could, see, you could see it all over him. And there's a fear, there's a common fear of black men, which I think is a bias. It's a bias that has gotten completely out of control. Right. So, the, you know, the, the bias synapse, the unconscious bias, you know, even as the name applies, it's this unconscious thing that we typically don't, mm -hmm. don't know about. You know, so what's the best way to... Uh, reveal, I guess, to yourself these biases that that you that you might have. You know, like like when when you had your bias towards white people, how how did you? What was the thing that made you say, "Well, wait a minute, I, I need to deal with this in a in a different way"? Uh, how was it exposed uh, to you? Because I noticed in my mind when things happen that I automatically can put it into a category or a person to. I knew that was white people. You know, anytime something happens that is <clears throat> negative or 
you trusted someone and then you look up and you realize that they have um, violated that trust, instead of me just saying, I, I shouldn't deal with this person, I'm saying white people get on my nerves, white people, white people, that's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, <laughs> that, that's a lot of people and it's not true. So I also noticed that when I had the same issue with a black person, I was giving them grace. I wasn't, you know, and they could have done something 10 times. And it's, it's like you, you kind of, well, I understand that. Well, no, that that's probably a person that you really don't want to have in your life, but you continue to give grace because you understand them or you feel like you do, even though this basic thing that, that you need in order to have friendship or to build relationship, you don't have it. But because you identify with them, it's okay. So I started to look at that and really think about some of the white folks in my life, some of the black folks in my life, and realize that that's a bias that I've had. And it it can come back so easily when something happens and it triggers you you know, you automatically go back to your old way of thinking. So it is a constant, I've been doing this 25 years. It is a constant thing. But now, as soon as it happens, as soon as I realize that I'm able to, to say, okay, you're doing, you know, you're, you're doing this and yeah. you need this. And so that thing for me, unconscious bias, my definition for it is that it's an unrecognizable part of your upbringing. Meaning that we're living through the past hurts and pains of the people who raised us. Mm-hmm. So for me, my grandmother was born in 1923. So you can imagine what, uh, what she may have gone. Through. And in her trying to protect me, that's how I learned. And God forbid you actually have an issue, you know, then it just blows up. It blows right. up. And you're, you're going all the way back to grandma's issues, <laughs> not dealing with, <laughs> with your issue with this one person who happens to belong to a group of a lot of people. Yeah. So we owe it to ourselves and them to do the work. Yeah. So that I mean, that's a level of consciousness that that you have that most of us uh, may may not have that you kind of recognize it in yourself and then decided to do something about it. Exactly. W- would you have been open to, let's say, a white person saying to you, hey, Risha, uh, I think you have this bias against white people and you you should do something about it. And and oh, by the way, let me give you some examples and mm-hmm. explain it to you. What would have been because because I think that's how it maybe right it's coming out. across yeah <laughs> right how how would how would you have responded and and how do you think the the those of us mere mortals uh, would respond uh to to that type of um, recognition by of our bias by someone else because that's really what we're asking people to do today yeah that that is a great question I think early on because like I told you and and I want to be real. I've been doing this a long time, but I still have to deal with that. So if early on had someone approached me and said that, I would have been, I would have thought now this white person is actually going to try to tell me how to deal with me. <laughs> <laughs> it would have just added on to everything else. There's right. no lie. But I'm also a person that even if I don't take the criticism in the beginning, I actually want to be the best person that I can be. I think I owe it to myself in the world. And so I will go back and think about things that people say to me and have to assess whether or not they're worth working on. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it won't just be one person that says something to you. You know, you start to, you start to notice a pattern of people saying that you're this way or that you do this. And for me, I'm kind of like, okay, if three people tell me that, it's probably me. <laughs> so I began to look, look inside. Also, I, I know that about myself. And if, you know, and if Black folks are honest, we do that a lot because we have, a lot of us have grown up with the mistrust of white people. And it's nothing for us to, to get together and have conversations. And you know, even when we're venting to each other, we, we talk like that. We put a whole group of people like white people get on my nerves. Mm-hmm. We do that. And, uh, and, and it's funny because even my group of friends, you know, we do that and I try to say something. They're like, shut up. That's what you do for a living. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> try to open up and have real conversations. So, yeah, I wouldn't have been receptive to it in the beginning. But you also know yourself. You know, if you have 
what what your uh, what your issues are. So you have to be willing to do the work. Everybody's not going to come along on this journey as great as it is, and as many emails as I'm receiving. I'm also receiving uh, emails from people that aren't happy about it, mm -hmm. that don't get it, and you honestly, you can't worry about those people because there's enough evidence out there. Systemic racism has existed since the world, uh, the world has grown into what it is. It's always been there. And one of the things that bugs me a lot is people continuously saying that the system is broke. The system is not broken. The system is doing exactly what it was designed to do. It was built that way. It works perfectly. Mm -hmm. So if you can, you can look and see that there is not equity, that's not hard to find. If you, if you don't have to do a whole lot of work, that's not a whole day's worth of research. You know, it's easy to see. So if, if someone is telling you that the way that things are set up does not create balance, does not create equality, does not create equity, and you're hearing that over and over and over again, it's on you. It's on you to at least look at yourself, to at least look at the system that in which we work. Even. What can we do to change that system? So get over yourself. We all need to get over ourselves and figure out what those things are in our lives that we have to work on. You know, we don't like it when our when people that we're in relationship with tell us something that, you're doing that, that hurts them. We get mad about that, so that's normal. Right. But if you can keep that person in your life, you're going to make those changes. Right. Yeah. So one of, one of the challenges that, that we have, you know, obviously with this, this happening in our nation and affecting our, our Air Force, just like every other organization is, uh, we, we sometimes have uh, commanders, leaders at various levels who say, hey, I, hey, I don't really know what to say. Um, what do you recommend to leaders in an organization like the Air Force, so really in any organization on, during this time as uh, black airmen, as black men and women, you know, uh, struggle with police brutality, systemic racism, the things that we've all grown up with. And if I'm a leader who happens to be a white person or, or uh, a non-black person, what, what do I say? What, what can I say to the people who work for me? First, I don't think you need to say anything. I, need to, I think you need to listen. It's really important for leaders to listen right now, to understand what their, um, what their employees, what, what the people under them are going with and what they're going through. Mm -hmm. Once you listen, you're going to validate those experiences. Because if you invalidate those experiences, they will not uh, come back and talk to you. You're not going to get what you need to talk about. Then, then we're going to act. So your job is to listen, validate, and act. And when I say act, I mean create change. Real systemic change. Yeah. Man, that's, <clears throat> that's really, really good advice. So uh, thank you. I appreciate it. I know it's going to be helpful for a lot of leaders. You know, I've, I've often said that this is a tough conversation to have. This is a tough subject, uh, but it is extremely necessary. And so I definitely appreciate all the great work that you've been doing in this, in this arena. Um, you thinking about expanding? You got so much business now. You got so many people calling on you. Uh, what, what are you doing? What's next for you? You want a job? <laughs> <laughs> no, I got I got a job. I got a couple of jobs. <laughs> I just want to keep growing. I just want to uh, hopefully keep shifting hearts and minds and and helping people to to think differently and, and think about how we can all make the world better. Yeah. Well, uh, again, I, I want to say thank you, man. I, I just appreciate you so much, and uh, I'll give you the last word if uh, anything you want to tell our audience. And uh, but but I definitely appreciate all the great things that you've been doing. I think we just all need to get over the BS and, <laughs> and and figure out a way to show people that we care and that we've got to stand together. Because if we don't stand up for others, there's not going to be anybody left to stand for us in our time of need. Yeah. No, that's powerful, and, and thank you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, uh, I want to say thank you to our guests, uh, 
uh, Risha Grant, uh, the author of That's BS, How Bias Synapse Disrupts Inclusive Cultures and the Power to Attract Diverse Markets. So we appreciate you and uh, I'll see you next time. You too. Take care. All right. Thanks.